All right. Good evening, everyone. You're welcome to today's World at Day panel session. The topic is increasing communities' capacity to effectively address climate change through education, civic engagement, and workforce development. Our guests today are Amy and Chibize. We'll give them a chance to introduce themselves. But before we go into the discussions, I'd like to welcome Cynthia, who would give us an overview of what EduSpot stars and all the information you need to know before we get into the discussion. So Cynthia, the floor is yours. Okay, hello everyone. Good evening. It's a pleasure to meet you all. So Edisports is a charity, but basically a network of um, solution-driven leaders who are community-based and are leading change in their communities such that we might unite to see the kind of future, sustainable future we would like to see. And we are doing this in different areas. We are working together to build both our volunteers as well as the learners who are the end beneficiaries of what it is we do. We are in 50 sports communities across Ghana and we run educational strands for the benefit of our volunteers. These strands are Edulit, which is literacy focused for JHS. We also have Ignite Girls, which ignites equity, sorry, which is a strand that is focused on gender empowerment. Both girls and boys matter. We are also into eco STEM, which is learning STEM in a sustainable way such that the environment is protected. And the last strand we focus on is educate, which is targeted at early year learners, early year learning in general. Additionally, we, we train volunteers under the sports lead strand, which is basically meant for capacity building and then putting our volunteers in the right state to be able to build partnerships and grow their sports. What we are aiming to do is to increase the agency of citizens to bring about the change they want to see in their communities. And that is why Ed Sports exists. And our motto is our collective future, which means that it is not only about what Ed Sports staff want to see, but what the volunteers themselves want to see in their communities. So they are very involved in the decision-making process and they are the heart of everything we do. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cynthia. So, climate change, we know, is a present global issue. It has far-reaching consequences for environment, society, the economy. And years of inaction and neglect has allowed emissions to accumulate, leading to rising temperatures, melting of ice caps, extreme weather events, which we are seeing the effects in real time in our agriculture and everything. So as we navigate the complexities of climate change, it's crucial that we lean into expert opinions. We lean into innovative approaches to empower communities to take action. And today we have the privilege of hearing from some of these experts. Without much ado, I have with us Amy Bray from Another Way. So Amy is a 21-year-old marine biologist and CEO of environmental education charity Another Way, which she founded when she was 16. Through Another Way, she has planted over 30,000 trees in Cumbria and has given talks and awareness sessions on climate change, plastic pollution, and sustainable living to over 8,000 people. Today, she'll be telling us a bit more about what she does and the importance of community engagement, civic engagement in taking climate action. 
Our other panelist today is Chibize Iziko. Chibize is the executive coordinator of the Strategic Youth Network for Development, SYND, which is a youth-oriented NGO in Ghana that promotes youth inclusion in the governance of natural resources and environmental sector. He's also a member of 350.org and the 2020 Goldman Environmental Prize recipient for Africa. He chairs the Youth in Natural Resources and Environmental Government, Governance Platform, which has enhanced the knowledge of, our, of over 50,000 young people directly and indirectly through social media platforms. So welcome, I guess, Let's hear from you before we go into the discussion. Just a brief acceptance. Let's hear from Amy Fez and Chibize. Welcome to the discussion. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me and um, for that introduction. I'm really delighted to be here and um, talking with such an amazing organization. And I'm really interested to hear maybe from the audience as well about your experiences. Um, I'm based in England, and I'm sure that we face very different challenges to people around the world. So it'd be really interesting to explore um, those unique challenges. And um, yeah, I think you basically summed it up. I'm running an environment education charity called Another Way, and I do a lot of work working with young people to support them to become climate activists and to take action in their communities. We're all about community solutions um, very similar to Edge Spots, in that we empower community leaders to then make action and influence within their schools and communities. Um, so I'm sure I'll be talking a bit more about that later. Yes, thank you very much. Chibize, a few words from you, and then we go into the discussion. Yeah, um, thanks very much, and I appreciate this opportunity. I'm sorry if my link is breaking because I'm trying to set it in, in the OTV region of Ghana. Uh, but I'm happy to be on this call to also share my thoughts on the climate and education. And of course, we also learn from the audience or those who will be joining us. Um, so I'm happy to be here. Um, thank you very thank much. Thank you. Over to you in the day. Thank you. So the first question goes to Amy. What educational resources do you believe exist that can empower communities to make informed decisions about climate action. And you can tell us a bit more about how specifically your organization is doing this. The educational resources that can be used to empower communities. Sure, okay. Um, yeah, so there's lots of climate science out there. Um, some of the science that is out there is quite inaccessible for everyone to read, especially if you don't come from a science background. And often it's also written in English, so um, it needs to be translated into other languages to make it more accessible for people globally. Um, there are some great organizations out there doing that, um, like Climate Cardinals, which translates climate science into lots of different languages. Um, at Another Way, my organization, we're working on making the latest environmental research accessible by writing it in a way that everyone can understand and relate to and also talking about simple actions that we all can do in communities to try and make a difference towards tackling climate change um, and I think that it can be very overwhelming to know where to start especially as an individual when it's such a massive global problem and it seems like we need massive solutions but there's a huge amount that we can do as individuals and communities to try and tackle our local problems and contribute towards solving the climate crisis so at another way we've built a whole platform called power of 10 where young people can access resources on how to take that action so everything from home challenges on how to reduce your meat or carbon footprint or plastic footprint and um, how-to guides on things like running beach cleans or tree planting or litter picks or giving assemblies and talks as well. So we can um, ha we have slide decks and assemblies that people can download and give in their schools or communities to spread awareness about climate change. Um, but aside from our resources on Power of 10, there's so many amazing websites out there. And of course, reports like the IPCC report that comes out every six years, 
and that is reviewed by hundreds of world leading scientists um, and it has some really interesting but scary information on what we all need to do to tackle climate change. Oh, I think you're muted. Shoot. I was saying that's awesome that your organization is working to simplify the information because it does come across sometimes as something very abstract and very difficult to understand, which leaves people a little confused on what to do and how they can contribute. So kudos to your organization for that. She be there. Um you mentioned your profile reads that your organization is using social media to raise awareness. How important is the role of non-formal educational, less traditional means of raising awareness in encouraging people or inspiring people to take action against climate change? Yeah, anybody can hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, I'm um, sorry. Yeah, the line was breaking. Can you please take your question again? Okay. So the question was, how important is the role of social media as a non-traditional way of reaching people in encouraging everyone to take climate action? Well, um, so thanks, thanks for the question. Um, I, I think that we is undebatable to indicate that uh, social media is one of the fastest and easiest means to reach out to people, irrespective of the background, you know, especially young people, when it comes to climate education. Um, and for us as an organization, one of the key things we've done is to simplify, by, you know, complex government materials. As you all know, when government is developing policies and plans, they can be very, you know, complicated, very complex, about 400 pages with the average young person they find very difficult to read. So we simplify, develop infographics, you know, some key statements, some key words from those national documents so young people can appreciate and more importantly, identify their role in the whole process. Because for us, that is a, that is our beginning chip. It's not about what government is saying, but creating the entry point for young people to also participate in awareness creation. I mean, for example, if you look at the existing conventions, the UNFCCC convention, Article 6 talks about the need to educate, you know, uh, provide training and all that. Article 12 of the Paris Climate Agreement also alludes to the same issue around education, awareness creation, and capacity building. So that is where, as young people, we can also contribute to the Article 6 of the Convention and Article 12 of the Paris Climate Agreement by also educating our peers and going to communities, you know, to educate them on climate change and what steps they can take to address or contribute to the fight against climate change. So social media has come today, and for us, it's a great vehicle that we are capitalizing on to reach out to young people and even the older generation on what can be done as far as you know the fight against climate change is concerned. So that has been um, our approach: simplify existing documents and vehicle to drive down towards the fight against climate change. Yeah. Oh, what do you need? Okay. Thank you very much. So it's come out clearly from both panelists that education in its simplest form is one of the ways that we can increase the capacity of people to take climate action. So in your opinion and from your experience, what are some of the biggest challenges that you have encountered in mobilizing people in building their capacity to take these initiatives? You've mentioned the work you're doing, but what are some of the challenges you're facing? Is that to me? Amy, if you want to go. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so I think there's a lot of barriers to taking action and a lot of them are psychological. So um, often we can think, well, what can I do in, in such a global crisis? How can I make a difference personally? And it can feel really overwhelming. Our own actions can seem very insignificant. And sometimes there are so many things that we can do to make a change that we don't even know where to start. 
Um, and then I think people can often feel very isolated and like it's someone else's responsibility to change. Unfortunately, over the last couple of decades, we've seen so many debates on who is responsible for fixing climate change. And people have been so busy arguing about it that no one has ended up taking accountability and actually trying to do something. Um, so I would say that um, the general public can face a lot of those barriers and that can prevent us taking action in our everyday lives. Um, and often we don't think that anyone else is out there doing anything, even though there are um, thousands and millions of people who care about climate change and who are trying to solve it. So I think it's really important to make our climate education accessible to people and to talk about solutions and individual things that we can do and make it really simple. So just talking about the most impactful things that we can do and talking about it with hope as well, because um, eco-anxiety is such a big problem now, especially in young people where we feel so scared and frightened about climate change and about our future that it can make us shut down and, and not act because we're despairing. So for me, it's really important to, to spread hope and positivity through education as well and to showcase all the good news stories and the great case studies that are already happening around the world so that we paint um, this positive light as well. Um, yeah, I hope that's answered your question. Oh, you're muted again. <laughs> I really should stop muting myself. So beyond making the information accessible, it's important that we say it from a positive note, make sure that we let people see the bright spots so it's not seeming all gloomy and it can inspire people to take action too. So thank you for that. Keep it there. Um, how do you think, how important do you think it is to integrate climate education into the school curriculum? And how can the government make sure that people are leaving school with adequate information to take action and contribute to the change? Yeah, um, I, I think that it is, it is very important to incorporate climate change into our educational curriculum. And um, let me use this opportunity to, Alice, um, appreciate the effort of our government so far. Um, at least in the basic schools, we have been told that climate change has been mainstreamed into the basic educational curriculum. Um, mm -hmm. So the next step now is about how do we implement, how do we ensure that you know children at the basic level uh, begin to appreciate climate change and more important. <laughs> To also take, you know, simple actions in their own way to climate change. So in that, in that corner, when I'm taking some major step, uh, it doesn't end there. Um, not just at the basic level, but uh, the the second cycle and even at the tertiary institutions. If you need to consciously have programs and courses that you know mainstreams or talks about climate change or mainstream climate change into the curriculum, I think that will help. But if you are talking about basic education, I will see that government has taken a major step. And uh, we we'll... Hello, Chibiza, are you still with us? Okay. I believe we've spoken enough about the education aspect. So we are going to move into the civic engagement bit, how to build communities capacity and civic engagement activities. So what would you say is um, a successful community-based climate action initiative? How do we measure it? How do we even conceptualize it? That's a tough question. I think that it's really important that we have a just transition to a renewable um, system. So we need to make sure that whatever changes we make are good for people and society and communities, just as they're good for the planet. So I would say that a huge measure of success is people's well-being and the jobs that we create in um, switching to that green transition. So jobs in um, agriculture and in renewable energy and in um, 
sustainable engineering and architecture or in education or policy and all of these jobs that are associated with climate solutions. Um, we need to increase the capacity for those jobs. And then a success for me looks like change at all levels of society. So people are inspired and empowered to live in a more sustainable way. They can afford to make more sustainable choices because the governments have made it easier for people to make those those choices that are better for the planet, whether it's subsidizing organic food or making it easier to um, charge electric vehicles or get on public transport or whatever it is that reduces our carbon footprint. Um, that communities have energy and food security as well, so that they're in control of their own energy supply and that it's clean and green and that they have um, food security as well. And then that businesses are also on board supporting that. So businesses are funding those community initiatives, but they're also taking green initiatives themselves and reducing their own carbon footprints, making sure that their activities are sustainable and regenerative. And then the governments are supporting all of those actions from the top-down approach as well. Um, and then we have that society that works from the top down and the bottom up so that every level is contributing towards the future that we want to create. Um, I think it's, it's quite difficult to measure that. And um, some of the most successful case studies that I've seen have worked with universities, for example, to actually measure the differences that have been made when um, individuals have reduced their carbon footprints and businesses have also got on board and maybe local councils or government have also made changes. So it's important that that's documented and researched by local universities or colleges um, so that everyone is on board and we can see the impact that we're making. That's great. I think for me, the central idea here is that the well-being of people could be the ultimate indicator because we could come up with all sorts of policies, ideas, but if it's not benefiting the people, it's not making them more prosperous, it's not providing a conducive environment for them to develop and achieve what they want to, then we are woefully failing. Um, Chief, is it from your ex? Experience, what would you say governments and policymakers can do to support community-led initiatives to encourage civic engagement towards climate action? Kibiz, are you still with us? Yeah, I'm sorry, my, my network is, is uh, <laughs> That's all right. Did you, did you hear that question? Oh, sorry, please come again. Okay, so I was asking from your experience what you think governments and policymakers can do to support civic engagement towards climate action. Well, um, I, I think that um, for policymakers and decision makers or politicians, what they can do is to create more space for that collaboration. And, uh, but... On that note, I must commend, you know, governments when it comes to climate change, at least I'm fully aware that there have been some in-depth discussions, conversations, particularly between the EPA and civil society. Um, and I don't have my heart for EPA when it comes to NAP issues, when it comes to the NDCs, EPA has been very responsive, creating space for CSOs to engage, to contribute, to participate, you know, in the discussions. Um, when Ghana had a chance to revise our indices, EPA created an avenue for CSO to make input and contribute to the development or the vision of our indices. So for And much affected by the climate impact. We need, uh, because politicians don't want to give space to CSUs to contribute in Africa. But I want to say, once it comes to climate change, he has no boundary, he has no respect, he has no political power, a political color. And therefore, it is important to have a common platform or space for best to tackle 
the increase in impact of climate change. So, um, of course, like I said, even good though government of Ghana is doing very well, uh, there's still room for improvement where we can bring it on board more, more uh, community people and then also even a private sector. So we can have a holistic conversation on how each stakeholder in the country can contribute to the fight against climate change. So, yeah, so just to add my voice, our government should maybe open up the space to the media, to the private sector, just as they are also creating space for the CSOs. Yeah, over to you. All right, thank you for that submission. So I know Chibita's line was breaking a bit. So just to summarize, for how governments can support in action is to give venue for CSOs and NGOs to lend their voice in the decision making. Yeah, yes. Um, um, I just also add two or three yes, years. Uh, um, can, can I yes, me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Sorry. Uh, um, so just, I was just adding uh, by saying that one of the comes to the COP, um, government has generously, you know, provided accreditation to CSOs to also participate at the COP meetings. Of course, government doesn't fund, but they provide the budgets so that CSOs can participate, you know, at the COP session. So again, that creates the space, you know, for government to engage more uh, with CSOs. So for me, this actually just demonstrates that there's some open conversation between the government and CSOs and other actors as far as civic participation is concerned. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, I dropped off for a bit. Chubiza, did you finish your submission? Yes, I, I did. Okay, that's great. So um, I want us to talk a bit more about um, social entrepreneurship. And we want to discuss what are some of the green jobs that are in demand now that are edge sports volunteers, staff, generally anyone can leaning towards to develop their skills in, pursue a career in, and also at the same time, help solve the climate crisis. So some green jobs that you think are in demand now. Chibi said you want to go first, then Amy next. Sure, sure, I'm happy to. Yeah, um, so yeah, I mean, um, one of the of the narratives around climate change is that even though climate change is impacting negatively on us, it's also providing opportunities. You know, it's also opening new doors that we can look at. Um, so for us at SYMD, um, in 2021, we established what we call the Young Green Entrepreneurs Project. So this is basically a project targeting our green startups, you know, as a way to create a space for dialogue, for capacity building, for engagement on how we can support them to grow their respective businesses. Um, so if I can just give you one or two key, uh, you know, specific examples. One of the major drivers of climate change is deforestation. The uh, filling of trees, indiscriminate filling of trees by timber operators, by illegal miners, that leads to climate change. And beyond that, people prefer to use to produce charcoal, you know, charcoal for cooking, which most people in communities are familiar with. But if we want to shift them from charcoal and we want to use FPG, it's a bit more expensive than charcoal. So people are still forced to go back to use charcoal as against using FPG. But here we have young people who are able or innovatively transforming organic waste into briquettes or pellets and which are potential substitutes for charcoal. And so that idea for us, you know, is, is a very huge, you know, um, 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 opportunity to showcase what the youth can do on board as far as fighting climate change is concerned. So these are some clear examples young people are bringing up, you know, plastic, um, uh, what they call it, plastic waste management and all that um, are, are clear examples some, that some of our members are actually pushing. And therefore we have shown or we have demonstrated that these are young people and we have evidence to show that these are clear business opportunities 
which of course needs more support, more investment to upskill and to replicate even in different parts of the country. So one of the major things we are doing now is to help address deforestation by shifting attention from charcoal to uh, okay. briquettes or pellets. So that is one of the things we are doing you know, in our small way as an organization. Yeah, over to you. That's great. Amy, do you want to take that? Some green jobs are in high demand that EG Sports Catalyst can start thinking about and considering. Yeah, well, I think there's jobs in every career and sector that um, can be made green and every career and sector should be made green. So you can basically make any job, whether it's um, a scientist and researcher researching the effects of climate change, researching solutions, whether it's a data scientist or modeler. Um, so there's lots of jobs in that sector, whether it's in ecology and conservation, so conserving local wildlife, um, like community mangrove restoration or um, protecting fish species or um, terrestrial species as well whether um, it is tree planting and restoring wildlife, nature. Um, and then also jobs like um, even being a lawyer, you need we need people to um, litigate against climate change and create new laws that um, protect our well-being and a green future. We need architects to design buildings that are more sustainable. Uh, we need teachers who can teach about the climate crisis and about nature and about ecology and biology in education. Um, and we need gardeners and um, farmers who can farm in a way that is beneficial for nature and for humans, as well as um, your income. So there are a whole diversity of jobs that are associated with the climate crisis. And then there's builders and engineers um, and plumbers and all of those kind of careers who can install renewable energy or infrastructure or insulate buildings. Um, and we're going to need all of that to fix the climate crisis as well. So I would say that basically whatever your dream job is um, or whatever you want to do within the community, there's space for incorporating nature and climate within that. That's wonderfully said. So everything can be made green, the first you're willing. So what are some of the um, emerging trends and technology that are supporting the fight against climate change that you know of, something that you find particularly interesting? Um. Yeah, so I really love nature based solutions. So, um, and, and community led actions as well. So, projects like um, equipping women with the skills to be able to protect their local mangroves or forest or wherever, um, whatever nature they have near their community, and actually creating permaculture. So, where we farm and grow vegetables and crops within trees and woodland so that you create um, food in harmony with nature too. And some of those projects are good for nature, they're good for wildlife, they're good for the climate, and they're also good for people as well and give us better food. Um, so that's some of my favorite projects, but I'm also a marine biologist, so I'm particularly passionate about our ocean and how we can use our ocean to um, both solve climate change and to increase wildlife. Um, so things like creating marine protected areas where um, we protect areas of the ocean so that fish can increase and we um, ban industrial trawlers. So the, the really massive ships that steal all of the fish and instead give the area back to local fishing communities who have more sustainable fishing methods. Um, and then that can increase the biodiversity in our ocean, which actually has huge potential to suck carbon out of the air and to solve climate change. Um, and the same for restoring mangroves around the world or here in the UK, seagrass and kelp um, absorb a huge amount of carbon too. Um, and just one whale can absorb millions of tons of carbon dioxide through its lifetime. So actually protecting nature can have consequences on the climate that we don't think about. So that's something that I'm really passionate about. That's great. Can you 
how can we encourage innovation and entrepreneurship in the field of climate solutions? And any examples from your experience would be helpful. Well, I mean, um, it, it is one thing to create a space or encourage innovation or entrepreneurship. And uh, it's another thing to find people willing, you know, to take up such responsibility. Um, fortunately, I've seen an increasing number of young people in diverse ways uh, who are, you know, gearing towards innovation and, you know, and, and creativity when it comes to entrepreneurship. Um, so I just mentioned one in terms of the um, organic waste briquette. We have young people who are, you know, bringing new ideas when it comes to renewable energy development and utilization. Um, even when it comes to waste management, you know, um, I've seen people using plastic, you know, recycled plastic in different ways, you know, reuse. And sometimes if you are told that it's made from plastic, you, you, you wouldn't believe it. So these are, there are pockets of, you know, innovation spread, you know, across um, the, the, the continent or across the world. But I think what ought to be done is to be able to look at the value chain. No, not everybody can be innovative. Not everybody can have the skills to start a new enterprise. But even when somebody starts a new enterprise, what are the value chain? You know, what are the other needed services that we can create? You know, another business as well. So, um, so that we don't create the impression that everybody must own a business, everybody must start an enterprise. It is not possible. You know, but let's look at the value chain. It can be the producer. It can be, uh, uh, you know, the the transporter. It can be the wholesaler, you know, so the whole child chain that you must properly, you know, look into. Once you open up a space, have that unpack the whole issue, then we can now identify the opportunities and then we can even, you know, and highlight these opportunities for young people to, you know, capitalize on that. So, um, so because more often than not, we, we create that impression and people feel that if they don't start their own business or they don't start something new, that means that they don't, they're not part of the whole idea of innovation and entrepreneurship. But I think that it's important to, you know, open up the whole value chain and see where we can identify the gaps and the opportunities and then support young people to fill in those areas. So, I mean, that'd be my, my take. And I mean, we see several things coming up. Almost every day, something new is coming up, you know, but let's look at the value chain, which can be sustainable, which can guarantee, you know, source of livelihood for young people and for women as well, you know, over, over, over a very long period of time. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. But sure, when you are going to try to approach climate change issues, you have to employ like a systems thinking approach because you cannot just do it from one angle and expect that it will have a holistic change across board. So it's important, like you said, to look across the value chain to dissect the issues and see when and where we can proffer solution. That's a great point. Now, as we are going... We have about 15 minutes left for this. If you have any questions, please leave it in the chat box. I will read them out. If you also want to ask the questions directly, just raise your hands. I'll give you the floor. To Amy and Chibize, Amy first, how can young people stay engaged and continue to, or even start to make a difference? How can young people stay engaged and make a difference? It's enough that people, some people feel saddened by it like you mentioned earlier there's a psychological stress and a burden about the despair but how can they move beyond that and take that little leap of faith yeah um i think that it's about finding something that they are really passionate about so i always work with young people to find their time Talents and their interest, whether that's art or gardening or singing or writing, whether it's public speaking, whether it's science, whether it's something practical or whether it's creativity or innovation, and use that to identify a problem locally that needs tackling and then try and use their creativity to fit their talents and their interests to something that needs solving because as you said the climate crisis is going to require such a systemic approach and so many solutions that there is something for everyone and for every talent to play in that um in those solutions so first of all i would encourage people to reflect on what they can offer and how they can use their skills to find something that makes them feel purposeful and motivated 
And then I would say to get the community on board. So whether it starts at school or a local community group or in their family, trying to make small changes to start with and then just take the next step and the next step. So I, for example, started making changes at home and then I started educating other people in my school. And then I took that to the local community and I started tree planting initiatives with community volunteers. Um, and that became really popular. And then I helped to open a plastic free shop in my local town um, with some other volunteers. So I identified the next step. Um, and it's like climbing a ladder, I guess. You can't go all the way to the top straight away. Um, but I would also say it's really important to find community. And whether it's a local community group or an NGO or charity they can get involved with that's particularly interesting to them. Um, or joining a um, an online community like the Power of Ten that I've created, um, or like other um, online communities on social media, um, or conferences that they can go to, so they can actually meet other passionate people, which can help you feel less alone and more part of a supportive network. Um, so yeah, I would say start at home, find your passions and interests and work out how you can contribute them um, and then find your community as well to help you out. Okay, thank you. She was there. Do you want to take that before I read the questions in the chat? How young people can stay engaged and start in their own small way? Yes, um, I... I... I will want to take it from the point of um, the main motivation or what will incentivize young people to even have interest in the first place. Um, given that I work more with young people, um, so I just want to share my own experience or my own approach. Um, for example, I, I would deal with students differently from somebody who is out of school because their needs are different. Um, and we, for the two, between these two groups of young people, the, when it comes to volunteerism, the expectations, again, are going to be different. So for those in school, I mean, I would want to engage them to, for them to appreciate or to see how they can um, take advantage of the courses they're studying on campus, especially those reading on social science, biological science, et cetera. How can they use the knowledge, the theory, the, the lessons in, in class? to take action, you know, either at home or on campus or in their own small way. So whatever they're learning in school becomes more meaningful, you know, for them. So that can become some motivation for them to even venture into the environmental discussions. For those out of school, I mean, the first, the major issue is about, I mean, something to be done uh, uh, sustainably or to, uh, you know, to get some income. Um, so I, again, engage people who are out of school on issues or, or on, on um, interventions that can help them earn income. And once they are even able to earn some income or even some stipends, it's able to motivate them. And let's not actually um, take it for granted that the climate conversation is now becoming a major business conversation. Um, so we must also look at it from that perspective. If you're talking about young people, they need employment, they need money, they need to take, take care of themselves. So if the climate change conversation can create such opportunity, then that can become a major incentive for them. So one of the arguments that I made, for example, uh, when I was engaging uh, partners in the early stages, that if we are doing campaigns, if we are doing awareness creation, if we are hitting the streets, why should we use the money to go and pay a third party to develop flyers or to develop uh, documentaries? Or we can give those monies to young people who also have the skill to do flyers and skill to do documentaries. So that those monies will go to those young people you know, directly. So they are also benefiting with their skills and abilities. Because sometimes we overlook that, that and that's just focus on passion or volunteerism. But for young people, you must provide them enough incentive or motivation for them to see that what they're doing is actually, you know, something very beneficial, you know, for their own source of livelihood. And so that is for me, um, the angle that I think we must start looking at it from. And that can also sustain our interest. After all, they are getting direct benefits from it. And therefore, it is able to guarantee that interest, you know, in the space. So that's what I have done, and that's an, an approach I will, I will want to encourage, you know, uh, when it, when it comes to sustaining the interest of young people in climate action. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. I'm going to read the first question, and either of you can take it. 
What simple and practical things can the catalysts do at the spots to make the models of local environmental sustainability action? To go first. Okay, Amy, you can go first. Okay. Um. Yeah. Okay. I um. I feel like I need a bit more context here, but I think that um some examples that I would use are um, maybe tree planting or rewilding. Um. You know, if they're spots based inland, then tree planting might be more relevant. Um. Or a local food project where um, food is grown locally, maybe um, in a way that's organic or better for nature. Um, and maybe if they're coastal, then looking at ways of harvesting um, ocean resources sustainably as well. And maybe I think the most important thing is getting the community's voice on board. So hearing from people in the community about the challenges that they're facing, um, the level of awareness of climate change, and the solutions that local people want um, and then acting on those. So definitely kind of hosting a community assembly, I think would be a great place to start. And then maybe doing some awareness raising at local schools or um, non-formal education centers and workshops or that kind of thing about climate change, um, diving a bit deeper into the science behind it, but also focusing on solutions that individuals can take. Um, and then maybe focusing on waste as well. So trying to reduce the waste of local communities, whether it's by introducing circular economy schemes. So things like um, making sure that rubbish is collected and you could repurpose it into, um, I've seen some really cool projects making um, plastic waste into um, art. So things like photo frames or um, pots or holders or, um, earrings or even jewelry and maybe that could be a local business that um could generate some income as well um so i think yeah listening to the community about what challenges and what needs there are and then maybe implementing some of the things i've suggested um and helping people as well to live more sustainably whether it's um increasing the uh, maybe some grants for local community action or switching to clean fuels um, or whatever it is that the community identifies. Okay, thank you. Keep it there. I think you'd be better placed to answer the next question. So Daniel wants to know what alternatives there are for our mothers in the village who use charcoal. I know you mentioned briquettes, but if you could explain a little more what that is and how much better that is compared to the cost of LPG and the normal firewood. Yeah, um, I, I maybe I may have to let Daniel know that the cost of LPG is not expensive just for those in the communities, but even those in the cities are complaining. You know that is is quite expensive. Um, so <laughs> uh, all of us, all of us are complaining. Not just everybody, people in the community. Um, you know, and and those those are some of the um. What I'll say that some of the policy incoherence that we may have to flag, you know, because we have a policy where government intends to circulate, you know, say about um, um, free cylinders to communities to shift their attention from the use of charcoal to the use of LPG. And now we have the cost of LPG going up, therefore defeating the original intent or the policy that the government brought up initially. So, yes, I mean, so that is another conversation we can have some other time. But in terms of the current situation, and I did mention uh, briquette, uh, which I mentioned that it is a good substitute for um, charcoal. So briquettes, are, they, they appear or they look like charcoal, um, but they are made from organic waste, you know, so the coconut husk, you know, ayer cassava husk, um, all those uh, pumpkin husk, you know, all can, can be used, you know, for, for, for what they call it, uh, for briquettes. And the other advantage is that they don't smoke on like charcoal. So again, briquette is also another key solution to addressing indoor pollution. And uh, so our mothers can be in the kitchen and cook and not experience smoke, or which will end up affecting their lungs and therefore leading to lung cancer and reproductive diseases. Um, so that is why we are we are pushing, you know, the 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 the, the briquette, you know, conversation. 
And again, the when you read the Ghana's Renewable Energy Master Plan, um, government has plan, for example, to distribute 3 million clean cool stoves by 2030. And clean cool stoves thrive or how to use clean fuel. And one of them is the other ethanol or um, the, the briquette. So that also creates a business opportunity that if people are buying clean cooking stoves, then they need fuel for the stove. And one of the key efficient stove is uh, fuel for the stove is the is the briquette. So that's why some of us are, are proposing or promoting, you know, the the, the briquette as better alternative, you know, to 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 the to the to the charcoal. So I want to create Daniel that um, yes, LPG is getting expensive. We don't have control over it, and it's all about government policy. But in the meantime, let's get clean cool stoves, let's get briquettes, which is cheaper, which is more efficient, which will also help address air pollution. And therefore, that will also contribute to the fight against climate change. So that would be my take, you know, on how to address or find a solution to the increasing, you know, prices of our LPG. Yeah, thank you, Ndidi. Thank you, Chibize. We have three minutes to go. If you have any other questions, this is your time to leave it in the chat. So my final question, or rather my final point, I'd like to give both of you, wait, are there any questions? Can I proceed? We have three minutes. Okay, I'll take that as a no. So Amy, in a few words, just round up why you believe it's important for the community to get behind climate change action. And then I'll give you visit the floor to do the same. Just round up your points in a few words for us. Okay. Well, I think that um I really love what Chibizi said earlier about um climate change being a great opportunity to um rethink the way we live as well as societies. So I think for communities, it's an opportunity to rethink the way we can have a better quality of life a better society, a better education, as well as a better environment to live in. Um, it's so important for all of us to care and to act because it's going to affect all of our futures, whether it's our food um, or whether it's our health or even the risk of flooding and famine and extreme weather events. So it's so important to all of us. Um, and to act, I think it's so powerful if we act together in communities and if one community gets together and supports each other to make the right decisions and to um, contribute everything they can do towards a better future for people and for the planet as well. Thank you very much. Can you say your last words? Yeah, so um, when, when it comes to community participation in all this climate change action, I will just want to focus on two main uh, approaches that we have to focus on. One is the recognition that the community people have equal rights to participate in the climate change conversation. And those rights are embedded not only in our constitution, but if you look at the uh, the bylaws in terms of the, the national youth policy and even the local laws, talks about the need to engage people when it comes to the decision-making process. So what it means is that Community people have the right to engage. They have the right to be heard. They have the right to speak their mind or contribute at the decision-making level. So we should not be seen as a different group of people and policymakers also be a different group of people. Climate change is affecting all of us. And therefore, as community people, let's, let's, let's appreciate or recognize our role and participate and make our voices heard in where funding should go or the kind of project that ought to be done in our communities to help address climate change. So the right to information, the right to participate is very key. You know, we need to emphasize and demand, you know, as community people. The second aspect has to do with taking measures that are beneficial or that brings about what I call co benefit So one key example for me to you know, just to end my submission is, I mean, when it comes to tree planting, and it is something that we've, we've, we've heard, you know, over the years, you know, that it's important to plant trees. But yes, but for somebody of people living in the coastal area, looking at the dwindling or depleting fish stock, what can be done to address that? And I'm told that mangroves, for example, is able to provide alternatives. So if people living in fishing communities are no more getting a fish stock as they expect, planting mangroves can become breeding grounds 
for shrimps or crabs, and that can become alternatives to fishing. So it's not just planting trees, but consciously planting mangroves because it comes with added benefits, not just addressing climate change, not just you know protecting you know avoiding sea erosion, not just controlling the the surges from the sea, but it's also creating or creating a breeding ground for 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 shrimps and crabs. So those interventions are direct and community people can benefit from that. So those are for me, you know, some of the actions that when they take, they can get the true benefit or the actual benefit at the same time also addressing climate change. So for me, when it comes to community people, these are some two key, you know, submissions or make the right to participate and number two, taking actions that will bring about co cool benefits. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we've heard from our wonderful panelists about the importance of taking climate action and how climate change is beyond an environmental issue. It's about safeguarding our health, food security, economic stability, and even future generations. So I hope we are all leaving this discussion with some inspiration to take action, to read more, to find a way to contribute to fighting climate change. Thank you, Amy and Chiviza for making the time today. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the end of today's discussion. Thank you very much, everyone. Enjoy your evening. All right. Thank you, Didi. Yeah. Good evening as well. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, babe. Bye-bye. <laughs>